Welcome to the Combat Learning Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Peacock. My guest today is Dr. Rob Gray, the Associate Professor and Program Chair of Human Engineering at Arizona State University. He's also the host of my favorite show, the Perception and Action Podcast. In this episode, we talk about the role of vision in motor control and how you can harness the power of the constraints-led approach to motor learning to improve your trainings. This one is packed full of useful information. So if you're excited to dive in, hit that subscribe button on your favorite podcatcher now. Welcome to the Combat Learning Show. <laughs> oh, thank you, Josh. My pleasure to be here. So um, I just uh, I just want to say that I love your podcast. I listen to it. Like I'm super excited every time an up, uh, episode comes out. And I just I can't get enough of that kind of content. <laughs> Great, thanks. I'm glad you enjoy it. Yeah. So. Um, my, I think a lot of my listeners, uh, motor learning is still kind of a new thing in in the combat sports community, and um, uh, so I, I was I wanted to uh, take a second first so that you could inter- introduce yourself to my audience um, and kind of let them know what you do. Yeah, sure. So I'm uh, I'm a professor at Arizona State University. Um, my background's in psychology. Kind of, I originally started looking at kind of visual motor control. So my my PA grad school, I did a lot on like visual information we use to detect, you know, something's coming at, at us, like someone's punching us, you know, where mm-hmm. the punch is coming from, how fast. And um, oh, wow. so I did I did that as kind of the basics. And then I've always been interested in applying that. So I've done it in a few different domains. I, I After I did my grad school, I went to I worked for Nissan, the car company, and some driving safety. And then I've kind of slowly more and more gone into more sports related topics because that's really where my really passion lies for this. So, um, so my, I'm really just interested in understanding how people control their actions, how they use perceptual information and what different kind of coordination strategies and how we can best, uh, you know, they acquire that, how we can train that in the best way. Awesome. That's an excellent segue into my next question. I'm just going to jump way off the deep end. I'm going gonna, I'm okay. gonna to ask you the question. <laughs> uh, what, what part does vision play in motor control um, and specifically in a, in a dynamic sport like boxing or soccer? Um, I think, you know, vision is, you know, for m- most of what we do, vision is our dominant sense because um, it allows us to interact with the objects, in, you know, in sports. It allows us to interact with objects that are far away from us, right? Um, the sense of touch, obviously, I could see it being important in combat sports, for example, when people are holding and close to you. But, but when you want to detect something far away, then vision is, you know, predominantly our, our best sense, our most effective sense for that. So um, audition, we're going to get some, some stuff from sound and touch. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, vision is going to be the most useful information because, as, as I say, it's, a, it's a, what we call a distal sense. It gives information about objects when we're far away from them. Yeah. Sure. Awesome. Um, so would you say that, so since we're, we're dominant vision and, um, most people that play sports at, at any, at any higher level, um, are going to need to be sighted, I guess you could say, um, are there, are there specific sources of information that you can, that, that, that are, I'm, I'm, I'm tripping all over myself, but are there specific sources of information that each sport kind of requires you to attune to? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. And I, I should say, you know, that we are visually dominant. That doesn't mean that people can't learn to do things with other senses. You know, people can learn to play, uh, visually impaired people can learn to play basketball, uh, ba- you mm-hmm. know, baseball, basketball, any kind of other sport. So you can learn to pick up information from the other senses, but in most cases, sure. vision. Yeah, but yeah, that's the biggest message, you know, that, you know, a lot of us are trying to emphasize that, the information that we do use is very, very specific to the skill we're trying to perform. Um, that that's why kind of the general skill things that we measure, uh, you know, things that they measure at the doctor's office, like acuity, when you read the eye chart, is not really predictive of how well you're going to do. You have to have sort of a base level. You can't have be deficient, mm-hmm. but being effective in in your sport is you have to pick up. You know, there's there's particular visual source of information that's going to tell you when someone's going to attack you, for example, in a combat sport, that's not going to be the same as all, at all as when someone's going to drive past you in basketball, right? There's going to be different sources of information that you have to tune to. And 
that's why you know you know you can give example lots of examples of athletes trying to transfer from one to another sport at a high level is not that easy because it's it's really really specific information you're using yeah that, i think that's a really important message um sometimes people are like they they'll come up with they'll come up with an exercise and and you'll look at it and it looks nothing like the the performance context or the target sport and they'll they'll come up with a rationale for you know it, it trains this this and that um but uh, I think, it, and, you know, it's it's cool that people are thinking that that type of depth about their sport. And but it it, it somewhat um, kind of reveals a a, a, a deficiency in, in like how motor control works. Would you Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think it's you know it's just a in some ways it's just a different view. You know, it's 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 a just different viewpoint. You know, I think it's mm-hmm. it's val- some it's still valid some of the ideas. You know. Yeah, um, I think it's just people have different, you know, I, for me, it's just effective use of training time. Right. So mm-hmm. a lot of sports like combat sports involve eye, eye hand coordination, right? You, you moving, yeah. you be able to move your hand quickly in response to something in your environment. So some people might argue bouncing a ball and catching it off a wall is effective way to train for a combat sport, right? Because you're using your eyes and your hands, but I would argue that's not an effective because you don't want to just move your hand any old time, right? You want right. to, we have with well, a phrase that I use a lot in my podcast, you want it coupled, right? You want to move in response right. to information, someone attacking you. So uh, for me, it's just a way more effective use of training time to do in context um, rather than using, you know, kind of artificial stimuli, things on a computer screen, you know, little balls and lights. Um, you know, th- there are research showing that those things can work, but for me, I think it's just more effective to focus on being in context, keeping the information that you're actually going to use in competition, having it present in practice. Yeah, for sure. I think there's definitely room for more, I guess you could say traditional old school styles of, um, teaching that, that maybe aren't super focused on, like you said, coupling percep- perception and action together. Um, cause I, I was really wrapped up in that as a, as an instructor years ago, um, just, just trying to look at any, any, any old way we could, we could do something really fun in class to try and build certain skills. But, um, like, like you said, something that you've really helped me with is understanding that if you want to serve your students with, with the training time that, that you have with them, that it's probably best to keep it all, um, as close to the, the performance context as you can. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, the the term that we use is representative design, right? Yeah. Trying to make sure practice has the same elements, the key, same key elements as the, the in competition. And that doesn't mean it has to be exactly the same. Like you can make it mm-hmm. artificial, but you want to do that kind of pr- in a principled way rather than just, you're right, just, um, you know, and, and if you just want them to have fun and, and you want it to be competitive, you know, they might as well have them play some video game or something right, that's <laughs> completely divorced from the sport. But if you want it to be actually directly relevant to their sport, I think I think you really need to make sure you have some the key elements there. Yeah, absolutely. So you mentioned uh, c- the coupling of perception and action and your your show is called the Perception and Action Podcast, but it's not just a cool name for a podcast. It's actually a, a concept. So uh, what, what is perception and action, excuse me, action coupling? Um, and uh, how, how does that, how can that help you put together effective uh, practice designs? Yeah, the, the idea, the real main idea comes from a you know, well-known person in psychology named James Gibson. And he kind of countered the, the traditional view of, of, of how we act is kind of very linear Almost so we perceive, we figure out what's out there, then we act, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so Gibson came out with the idea that these two things are constantly interacting and, and going together. So not only do we perceive to, to act, we act to perceive, right? So, so moving around sometimes as you're a fighter, right? You're trying to perceive a weak spot, right? In, in your opponent, an opportunity, an opening. Right. So you're acting in that case to perceive something about your opponent. Mm -hmm. So these two things, uh, he argued, you know, you're coupled and you can't you shouldn't really train them apart. Right. Um, So his point, you know, we we tend we do that a lot in in sports training and a lot of other things, you know, hitting a bag, um, punching a bag is is separating action from perception right you're you're punching mm-hmm. without the stimulus for why you're punching <laughs> and if you're just right. doing that for exercise and building strength that's fine right 
um, the, uh, the, and we also do that. We do that on a lot of my side where we just do perception without the action. So we have people mm -hmm. look at a pattern and judge and make a passive judgment or, or things like that. So, um, his point was that there's things are so coupled and linked. You can't really separate them. They're inseparable. Yeah. And like one thing that I've learned a lot on your podcast is that, um, the, uh, your gaze behavior is really important in terms of, um, the, the information that you're attuning to and what you're seeing there in that specific, the spot where you're holding your gaze can be really important to things like predictive cues. Like if, like, if you like trying to figure out if somebody's about to kick you or punch you, um, or change level or something like that. And that can be very, that can be very different between different sports, per, maybe even between different combat sports. Um, so I, I, uh, when you were talking about, um, when you're talking about sometimes acting to perceive, like that's for me, that was a big, that was an eye opener because uh, there's a there's a, a a a very popular grappler known as Marcelo Garcia, and he he has a method of um, frustrating his opponents where he just does little actions here and there to kind of perturb the the his opponent, and then create openings and see where you know where he should actually move next. Yeah, no, that's that's a great example. That's exactly what. Gibson was kind of talking about is, you know, trying to uh, gain information by acting. And yeah, I think I remember, I don't remember, I think I talked about a study in the episode a long time ago where showing that different combat sports, there's more importance for lower body versus upper body mm -hmm. detecting movements and things like that. So yeah, you're right. There is a lot of research showing that a big difference between higher skill level and lower skill level performers is where they look and when. Right? We just mm -hmm. have such a short time in most of these sports. Things are happening so fast. If you're not looking in the right place, you're going to miss, um, you know, that the fact that someone's going to attack you or an opening. You know? Yeah. Sometimes I've, I've, I've got the, the, um, advice from instructors before they were certainly well-meaning, but they would, they would say things like, um, to asking me to, to follow the fist to <laughs> like to watch mm -hmm. somebody's fist to see if it was going to, uh, punch at me. But, um, when, you know, when you're close to someone like that, a punch is really fast. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, and, and I don't know, I honestly don't even know if that's the best advice. Like it, some, some, something, some, something tells me it might be better maybe to focus on, uh, the shoulders or the, the midsection. So you can see how the, the knee and the shoulder are working. Cause people tend to kind of rotate a little bit before they punch, but I don't know. That's just me thinking out loud. Yeah, <laughs> no, no, there are a couple of good points there. I think, you know, one, one of the things we know from, for example, there's research on deception, like in basketball, when you juke around someone or yeah. football. And we know that people juke with their kind of extremities, their head and their upper body, right? You can't fake someone out with your hips, <laughs> really. Your right. hips go where you, so looking at the core, you're right, is really going to tell you where someone's going to move. And there's also a, a, a kind of a gay strategy that I, I don't know for sure. I've never, I haven't really studied combat sports, but the, I imagine this could be effective is where you kind of just lock your, we call it the pivot point strategy. You just look in the middle and keep your eyes so that you can see kind of everything at once in your periphery. So you yeah. could, you could see, if you focus too much on one hand, I imagine the person's other hand, you know, you're leaving open for an attack as you're not, if it's going to be way in your peripheral vision, you're not going to see it as well. Whereas if you keep focus in the center, maybe you could see attacks from both directions. That's kind of me oh. thinking out loud too. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. That's actually, uh, that's a common teaching, especially in the kickboxing realm because they do lots and lots of fighting. So it's, everything's dynamic. Um, and that, that was, uh, thankfully, I think most of my other instructors had taught me that too. And that's kind of what I, I told my students now, I, I don't know where in terms of center mass, I don't know where it, it would be the best place, like more, more at the solar plexus or at the waistline, but, um, like it's probably a lot better than trying to <laughs> bounce your eyes around from fist to foot to, to knee. Yeah, I think so. I think unless you have some kind of systematic way that you're scanning and then quickly moving yeah. around. Yeah. Yeah, that would be interesting to just to slow down footage of MMA fighters and kickboxers that are really high level and kind of try and figure out where their eyes are going. <laughs> during, yeah, definitely. During yeah. matches. That would be an mm -hmm. interesting study, I think. It would. Yeah. And yeah, someone could get an eye tracker on them if you want to get really crazy. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> as long as, as, long sure. as you don't let them hit and uh, wreck it. <laughs> oh, I, yeah, I would love to do something like yeah. that. Like uh, yeah. my the combat sport that, that I practice most is Taekwondo. I've, I've done that for a really long time. So mm -hmm. I would I want to be uh, I want to become a coach again in that and kind of try, try and try and use the constraints led approach to 
produce athletes, but um, eventually I'd, I'd also like to try and do a little bit of research like that too. Like that would be super cool to figure out where the Olympians are placing their eyes. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I think I, I think there's definitely it's a sport that I don't think has been too much uh, gaze research done in in the combat sports. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. I can't. I can't. I can hardly find any any research on <laughs> taekwondo sport. Um, but yeah, for sure. So like sparring and fighting are probably the most common types of competition in combat sports. So, but there's 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 a, like a there's kind of very tradition based, like very long lasting. Um, uh, tendency towards, I guess you could call it decoupled training. Like you mentioned bag training. Um, so like there, people will do things like they'll do scripted two man exercises, or they'll do a solo, like a kata, what we call a kata or a form. Like it's like a prearranged set of movements. Um, just w with literally nobody there, like no perceptual information. It's, it's totally, um, just them. Um, mm -hmm. and people, people will, they'll, they'll say, they'll speak of those exercises as if they will um, make you a better fighter. And, and maybe there's an indirect way in, in which they will. But my question to you is, if I want to be a better fighter, how valuable is practice that doesn't have the same information cues and dynamics as fighting? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. And you'll get varying different, very different opinions on that, that question is. Um, yeah. My belief, so the one kind of really traditional view is that you need to learn the quote unquote technique before mm -hmm. you can get into the environment, right? So you, I need yeah. to learn the proper way to throw a punch before I get into a fight, right? Where my bow, how I lead with one foot, where my feet are, you know, mm -hmm. so we need to learn. And that is typically done in isolated, uncoupled practice, right? Your coach is, mm -hmm. you know, your foot, move your foot, do this, and lots of repetitions. And the traditional view is you learn that first. And then we put you into a fighting context. The, the way that I prefer, and a lot of some people are moving to, is learning the quote unquote technique in context, right? So punches mm -hmm. have a purpose, punches and, and dodging someone has a purpose, right? So, yeah, keeping it coupled, you develop, you develop, I think you develop more functional. Um, so, you, you punch, you know, you, you still, there's still room for a coach to correct and, and give, sure, you know, give suggestions and things like that. But, um, I think learning it in context develops more functional. Um, you get better to see, you learn decision making when to throw the punch, right? You, yeah. Doing technique drills, you never learn when is appropriate to throw a punch or when to block. Yeah. So yeah. That, um, you, we kind of learn those after. And so what you find, especially with younger athletes, is they get a very small proportion of training time is actually involves making decisions. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of it is doing these rote movements and technique drills so um you know there can be a place for those but i i per my personal belief is the more you keep it in context the the technique will come along uh, mm -hmm. maybe a, 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 it'll take a little while but it'll be more effective and more it's also the idea we, we're really focusing on in, in my approach is adaptable right so yeah. if you learn one way to punch and then you get or one way to block and then you get a weird left hand i know in boxing sometimes when you face like a left hander or something it can throw people off right yeah, yeah. You're, you're used to doing one thing one way and right I, my belief and there's research to show it is when you train more in context you develop more adaptable right you're, you're you can adjust easier to different changes in the environment yeah absolutely and it, you're you're totally right like especially in boxing um if you're doing something like karate they 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 kind of police the the way you do a movement so you can't score unless it's a perfectly straight punch for example but in boxing you're just trying to knock the guy out so you can come at any weird angle you want um and if you're you know you're not used to using some blocking something that isn't a perfect semicircular hook or a perfect straight uh jab or, or straight right i mean you could definitely catch something right across your jaw because you blocked the wrong way you know at the wrong angle <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Yeah. You know, though, in, in the research lingo, we call it, you know, differences in task constraints, those kind of mm -hmm. some sports where there's form restrictions and rules. And obviously you got to put those in, you know, in one in mind and that I do is I do a lot in baseball. And if you look at the baseball, the way a baseball pitcher and a cricket hurler throw, they have different 
rules, <laughs> like of keeping right. their arms straight. So you have to obviously have that and in practice the those constraints uh, there. You, you if you can't just let someone go. So th there's a common misconception in area this area that um, this type of practice is just letting the athlete go do whatever they want, right, mm -hmm. and not coaching them. And that's not it at all. You still have to give them guidance and add constraints so they. They, they get the form and follow the rules that you're looking for. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's an excellent segue into my next question, which is, um, I, like, I think I totally think it's awesome to try and actually teach somebody the basics of a martial art or a, any sport in the context that they're going to use it in. But I think um, a lot of instructors will be uh, – uh, concerned maybe that if they toss them straight into a, a sparring session, that it's just going to be too, too intense to be, um, conducive to, to learning. So uh, what, what are some practical, um, tech techniques or tactics that you could use maybe to keep something in context when, when you have a, a very base beginner, beginner, but still keep things in context? Yeah, so I think you're right. You're right. You don't definitely don't want to throw, uh, you know, an, an inexperienced athlete into the full situation. It's going to, you know, most cases be too much for them to handle. So that's where you really, we really try to keep the focus on the representative design principles. So mm -hmm. what you want to try to do is simplify the task, you know, but keeping the kind of information there. So if you want to teach someone to punch, instead of having them hit a bag, maybe you could have just a coach, you know, with glo putting gloves up and hit when I move the glove, you know, target. So mm -hmm. in that way, the person is still, the information is still kind of there. They're, they're hitting in response to a, a body, the information from someone's body, opponent, uh -huh. rather than artificial information like a target on a bag or, or, yeah. or something. So, so try, you want to keep a couple things, keep the basic information the same as much as you can, right? It doesn't yeah. mean you have to have someone fighting back or, or, but having a coach moving their hands or, or something like that. And the other right. thing is we call action fidelity. We want the movement to be as similar, uh, to what you want in the end as possible. Yeah. Awesome. That's, um, that's, that's excellent advice. Um, for me, think, just thinking out loud, uh, punching to the glove is, I think a great, that's a great suggestion. Um, one, one thing sometimes a, a lot of boxers, especially kickboxers do this too, is they'll use uh, focus mitts. Um, but one thing I did notice with focus mitts is that, uh, the, the, the cues that you give with the focus mitts don't to get a certain, um, a certain response, like, uh, is actually different than the, the body movement you would make if if you were to make the same response in an actual fight, like in the ring. Um, I know that, that, that obviously you can't make everything perfectly representative, but do you think that that could be, that could be some, that could hinder somebody in their development to, to train, um, to respond to certain body movements that don't match, uh, the, the, the actual movements you would need to respond to in a fight? Yeah, that, that is, that can be really, that is definitely something you want to avoid and can actually be worse in my opinion than uncoupled, <laughs> completely uncoupled yeah. training because yeah. yeah, you definitely don't want to have uh, in practice people being able to use kind of a strategy or, uh, in, or information that's not going to be there in, um, in the real situation. No. So for my sport, baseball, the one that I always get on is, you know, hitting off a pitching machine. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times teams will t put a pitching machine on the mound and they set it at the same speed all the time. Wow. Well, if you do that, the batter in that situation, the batter can start their swing. The, they just have to wait until the ball's a certain point from the machine mm -hmm. and they know when it's going to be there. They also can hear it, <laughs> uh, come yeah. getting shot out. So they get the strong auditory cue. Neither of those things are going to be there when you have a real pitcher varying the speeds and things. So you're teaching the, the, the athlete a strategy that's going to not work. And that gives you what we call usually negative transfer. So they're actually mm -hmm. worse after you train yeah. them than they were before. So in that case, I, I would rather, you know, it's better to do hitting a bag or something where there's no information, right? So unrepresent, sure. un, unrepresentative information is even worse. Yeah. Yeah. That's, um, it, it, yeah, like that's, that's the, I've gotten a lot of trouble talking to people about that. Cause that's kind of the, one of the sacred cows of, of martial arts training. Um, 
But right now, I just I don't have I can't I don't have the evidence for something like that because you know people who compete on the very highest level do lots and lots of mitt work. Um, you know, and it, it could be the case that they just they they have so much sparring time, so much ring time that it doesn't matter. Um, but you know, some of the best trainers like Freddie Roach does just tons of tons of of mitt work. Um, so that's it's one of those weird conundrums. Yeah, it is. There's a couple, you know, uh, points that I was, you know, one is, you know, as human beings, we're just we're learning machines, right? So yeah. um, almost anything you could do with an athlete, especially a lesser skilled one, they're going to get better. Um, but what you want to try to do is get them better at the quickest rate, right? And also right. the other ways we things we look at, you know, how transferable is the skill when it's in a different situation? How well do they yeah. retain it? So, um, you know, although some things might work, there might be even more effective ways you can get them to improve. Um, and then the other thing is, you know, yeah, you have to be careful of kind of anecdotal evidence from a, a really elite people. You know, mm -hmm. it doesn't necessarily mean it's appropriate for a lesser skilled one and they could do anything, right? Some, some athletes right. could do anything and, and they would be effective. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, like they, in my head, I try to explain it as, um, you know, they have so much experience, so many years of experience that doing a little bit of pad work with, with somebody is not really going to cause them to have a, a, a big detriment in skill level. <laughs> yeah. I think there's also, you know, the one thing that I try to emphasize when working with coaches is that training sessions have different functions and different purpose. Mm -hmm. Like, so what we mostly talking about is skill acquisition, skill development. You know, developing yeah. technique, developing effective coupling and uh, technique and, and whatever. Um, that's not the only, sometimes practice is about being confident or, you know, getting used to handling pressure or just, you know, warming up. And so not everything an athlete does has to be about getting better and improving, yeah. right? So some of those drills, maybe, you know, that's just wait, the, what they like to do to feel confident. And, you know, again, I keep going back to my sport, but in, in baseball, batters do batting practice before a game where they're hitting off of a speeds, a, a coach throwing at speeds that are a half or two thirds, the speed they're going to get in the yeah. game. So yeah. it's just a way for them to warm up and feel confident. And at that point, you, you're not working on getting better right before a game. So, so I, I right. think it's really important for a coach, you know, what's the purpose of this? Is it for just yeah. fun and getting people to feel confident and, and then you want to, you know, or if you want, really want them to, de to develop and improve in their technique, the, the expression we, you know, a lot of us use is learning is messy, right? Um, yeah. If they're doing everything perfectly, you're not learning anything, right? You need to make mistakes and, and, and they'd be kind of chaotic to, to get improvements. Yeah, that's, that's, um, you, you just mentioned mistakes and that that's a, an integral part of the learning process. I wish that's something I just, I didn't understand until uh, the last couple of years. Um, and in the martial arts, especially there's, uh, especially in the really, really traditional kind of corner, it's, it, it, we, they instructors, and I did this too, I'm totally guilty of this, um, it, with my students is we would, we would put together this perfect progression of, of, um, of drills and, and exercises to where it's so easy not to fail in, in, but and it's just, you can always do it right. And it, and it moves you up to the skill that you, the, the performance that you want the person to have. Um, but then, you know, when you go to a, a transfer situation where you want to actually spar or, or do some sort of uh, interactive drill, then it all disappears. <laughs> yeah. Um, mm -hmm. is, is the, is, is that called errorless learning? Is that what that concept is called? Um, no, uh, it's sort of, um, sort of, uh, yeah, kind of, it's, there's sort of a, so, so what you're talking about is kind of the, the, what we, sometimes we, we talk about it in, in motor learning, the performance learning paradox, right? So yeah. what you see in practice is performance in the moment, right? Learning is not that learning is some future, what you're going to do in the future, right? Getting better down the road. And so. Be looking good right now doesn't necessarily mean you're getting better for the future. In fact, it right. usually doesn't, right? But yeah. looking, bad, looking bad right now usually means you're getting better for the future you're learning. Yeah. Um, er errorless learning is um, sort of related. It, it's a type, one of the types of learning that a lot of people, that's sort of related to some of the things I've been talking about is implicit learning, mm -hmm. where basically you learn without too much 
kind of conscious awareness of how you're doing things and exactly, you know, so. Uh, and, oh, okay. Yeah. And so you're, you're kind of, you learn how to do a technique without, you know, being too aware of exactly, you know, the mechanics involved in punching, for example. And so yeah. one way that you can achieve that is, is by, um, one way is by starting the task really easy and making it more, di- more and more difficult. So the, per, the, the, the idea is that the performer doesn't think too much about what they're doing because they're successful at the start um, yeah. and then they get more difficult. Yeah. So they're, they're kind of a, a little bit different. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that makes sense. I'm glad I asked you that question because mm-hmm. I was under the impression that the airless learning was like just trying to make a perfect progression of, of, uh, of exercises or drills that where you don't, you're not, yeah. you can't really fail basically. Yeah. <laughs> in, in errorless learning, you actually eventually do fail. You just, yeah. you start off. So uh, like in golf putting, you start really close to the hole and move away in a way. Um, and, uh, and, and then the opposite in the, in studies, the opposite is error full learning. So you start uh-huh. far away and close. So in the yeah. end, both, both you have the same practice, do the same things. It's kind of the order that you do it in. Yeah. Okay. So it's somewhat akin to like a, a starting from negative. Like if you're learning a different lift or something, um, uh, like, 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 a uh, a pull up, <laughs> like if you don't have the strength to do a whole pull up kind of starting from the top or from negative and then letting yourself go down um, yeah, I got, until, yeah. until you run out of strength. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The so, idea, the idea is basic idea is behind is, is when you make mistakes and, and things don't go well, you start thinking about it and yeah. hypothesis testing. Why didn't that work? What should I try? Whereas if things are going well, you just like, oh, well, I'll just keep doing that. <laughs> and you don't think about it. Yeah. So it's more implicit. Yeah. Yes. And in, in the vein of thinking about things, um, I, I know you're, you're a proponent of the constraints led approach to motor learning, which is probably totally different as an approach to training and coaching than most people in the martial arts realm are used to. So I, my question is, um, how does the constraints led approach differ from traditional approaches of, to motor learning? Um, in what's kind of a, a, a quick and dirty way that people can, can conceptualize how to use that to create more skilled athletes? Yeah. So the fundamental difference is, is that, uh, constraints led approach, the idea that's kind of main idea that's different from the traditional way is that there's not one perfect technique that you're aiming to achieve as a coach. The best mm-hmm. technique for an athlete is actually they'll find themselves through a process mm-hmm. of self-organization. Um, so you need to let the athlete kind of discover the best way to throw a punch or do whatever skill you're talking about on their own because they need to find one that works for them based on their own individual you know, constraints, we call it. You know, So an athlete brings their own constraints, their own height, mm-hmm. weight, flexibility, uh, reaction time. And so... What works for you, me might be different than what works for you because of these individual constraints. So the, the traditional way of coaching is here, I'm the coach. I know the answer. Here's how you punch. Now I'm going to give you the answer. Mm-hmm. Uh, the constraints led approach is just one, it's just one way of, of doing this, but it's kind of the main way is I don't know the answer. Uh, you you got to figure it out for yourself. I'm going to create an environment where I'm going to kind of push you and help guide you to, to the, find the answer yourself. So, um, the way, as I said, constraints manip- led approach is just one way of doing that. So in a constraints led approach, what we're going to do is change some aspect of the environment to try to get an athlete to try something different or cert- what we call search for a new movement solution. Um, so an example, you know, I'm t- trying to think of a good martial arts, you know, Maybe a, uh, if a martial arts athlete has poor balance, right? They're mm-hmm. standing with too narrow a stance. The traditional way of, of coaching that would be to explicitly tell them, you need to keep your feet wider apart, you know, keep your knees bent. So lots of yeah. reference to the body technique. Okay, here's some drills. Keep trying this over and over again. A constraints led approach might be to like put an obstacle on the ground that they have mm-hmm. to move around and stand. So you don't tell them, You have to do it. Here's how you do it. You just uh, create a practice environment that kind of encourages them to to Mm -hmm. do that. Um, You know, uh, in in my baseball example, you know, sometimes we get baseball pitchers that what happens is they move their arm away from their body too quickly when they're they're delivering the pitch, which can cause injury. So what we do is we take a, a kid's rubber ball and we put it 
they have to hold it against their body and, and while they're throwing. And so we're not telling them how to, we have identified a problem, but we're not telling them how to correct it. We're, say, okay. we're creating, adding a constraint, the ball or something on the ground or, you know, and we're, we're letting them within that constraint find the own solution themselves. So, so that's kind of this, uh, this, the core difference is this idea that the best way to learn is through self-organization of the athlete. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. So they have to kind of discover it on their own, but within a, uh, an environment that is somewhat structured by the coach to kind of help them towards that solution. Yeah, exactly. The idea is like, uh, the example I always give is running. Like you think about no one for almost all of us, no one taught us how to, what the running technique is. <laughs> Right. We just right. learned as a kid, we just figured out what works for us. And you see lots of different styles, different stride lengths, different. And um, so we self-organized with that. And but yeah, the, the constraints that approach is, you know, you know, the you in, in coach, you're, again, it's not just letting them do whatever they want. It's identifying things and kind of trying to push them to different kind of air to try different things or mm -hmm. if there's something you don't like trying. So one of the reasons we call it constraints is it kind of eliminates options, a constraint. One, yeah. of, one aspect is eliminate options for an athlete. So, um, you know, we can, by adding a constraint, you can take away some things that you don't like that they're doing, for example. Cool. Very cool. So, um, I'm curious about this because I don't really, I don't know the answer to this, but um, whenever I hear discussions about the constraints-led approach, like topics like ecological dynamics, dynamical systems theory, nonlinear pedagogy, they're, all, they're always close behind. Um, and I was wondering like where the constraints-led approach fits in there. Is it, is it like a, a framework that can, that takes the, those theories and kind of gives you a, a somewhat of a, a practical way of applying it into practice or am I totally off base there? No, no, you're exactly right. And I, it's one of the reasons that you get a lot of confusion in, in this area topic that, yeah, ecological psychology and dynamical systems theory are kind of the two underlying theories of that support the constraints that approach. And they've been kind of put together by Keith Davids and colleagues called the ecological dynamics. Mm -hmm. um, so ecological psychology is Gibson's idea of keeping perception action coupled. And that perception is kind of, there's information in the environment that we can use to perform our actions. And then dynamical systems is the self-organization idea. And so you kind of put those together. Um, so again, yeah, so that's the theoretical kind of underpinning. What sometimes leads to confusion, right, is a lot of the things that we, we manipulate as constraints in different sports, people have been doing for a long time. So for example, yeah. soccer, some of the constraints you can manipulate are making the field smaller, changing the number of players on the field, doing all these things. And a lot of people were saying, will say the expression people use is that's old wine in new bottles. Like there's nothing new mm -hmm. about that. We've been, but yeah, what's new about that is using it for the purpose of self-organization, right? So just manipulating, you know, I'm sure in, in combat sports, p people manipulate lots of things about the practice environment. Right. Uh, you know, change the size of the bag, change the distance the person is standing. But in most cases, the purpose hasn't been to allow for self-organization. It's has it's been to try to get them to do exactly one perfect technique. So if you're if you're going to use the real constraints that approach, it you do kind of it is kind of based on this these theories and these ideas. You don't have to know all about them, but I think the key is knowing the coupling ideas and the self-organization idea. Um, if you don't really believe in those, <laughs> then you're probably mm -hmm. constraints that approach is not for you. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to make headway in the martial arts community with that. It's uh, it depends on where you come from guys in the Brazilian jujitsu, uh, side of things and the MMA side of things. I think they're very, they're ready for that because that that's the type of training they kind of do already. They just don't have a structure or a way to explain it or any theoretical underpinnings, but then um, my, my tribe, the guys I come from are, are more of a tradition, very, very traditional background with like the karate Taekwondo, they're all over the place. So a, a lot of, a lot of what they teach is almost word for word predicated on an information processing theory, whether they studied that or not. It's just very, very technique based, very, uh, isolated types of training methods, um, trying to perfect one technique before moving on to another. And there's not, there's not a lot about, uh, decision 
training in um, self-organization and, and manipulating constraints for the sake of uh, producing um, more, I guess you could say, affordances or so, to, uh, to, to, to make you stronger, not just as a technician, but as, a, I guess you could say, a tactician. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, that's definitely something that, that I see a lot. So if, if, if somebody is, um, if, if they're, if they're kind of struggling of trying to move out of that paradigm where everything is very isolated, um, it's very, it's not very often where you take different isolated exercises and combine them into the performance context. Um, and, and they want to, uh, fall, fall prey to the, the temptation to, um, to provide too much coaching feedback, maybe like what sort of advice would you give to somebody who, who is kind of considering the constraints led approach, but they, they're, they're kind of a scared to make the leap. (laughs) Yeah. So I I guess there's two things. One of them is the one, what you kind of mentioned is just really try as a coach to not say very much <laughs> and see what <laughs> happens. And I've yeah. actually done, I've, I've talked to someone that's done this too. Now, what I've actually done is uh, sometimes when I've worked with uh, teams um, and uh, someone gave me this, a uh, person gave me this, is I turn the music up really loud. <laughs> so yeah. the coaches, they, if they want to say something, they have to go right over to the athlete. So they uh-huh. do less of it. <laughs> they can't yell and no one will hear them. So that's one right. approach. But the other way is I think the kind of the halfway house from um, traditional coaching to the more self-organization uh, ecological ideas is is variability, adding variability mm-hmm. to practice. So if you're not quite as sure that you want to let the athlete completely explore and, and then try adding more variability to your practice conditions. Um, you know, that I think is a really low hanging fruit. I think that even if yeah. you're going to stick with a traditional approach, that that is going to have so many benefits for an athlete. Mm-hmm. Um, if you vary up the distances, sizes, you know, position, body, starting body positions, you know. Um, so, and I think in a lot of cases, I think you'll see benefits that might convince you to try to let's go all the way <laughs> to the, yeah. the self organization. Yeah. I love it. It's the gateway yeah. drug into ecological yeah. dynamics. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's awesome that's great advice um uh, this is a little off script like i didn't plan to ask this question but i was wondering i know you've talked about um uh dr uh, i think it's joan vickers with the uh, the decision training i was wondering um kind of if you thought that would be a great uh model that you could use of like a really because she 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 outlines in her book um uh perception, cognition, and I can't remember the rest of it. I'll, I'll put it in the show notes, but, um, she, she outlines some really practical tools that you can use to make your practices great for decision training. I was wondering if you thought that that might be a really practical and easy to understand way to make your practices more representative. Yeah, I think that that's one of the really good resources out there. Um, I think some of the, the constraints books coming out, um, Mm -hmm. The, uh, the, there's um, one by Ian Renshaw and colleagues that constraints that approach. And then there's a new edition of the dynamics of skill acquisition coming out. I was just talking to one of the authors about that, that, um, that has some, it has a chapter just talking about coaches about how uh, written by coaches about how to do different practices and keep it representative. So the, the, the challenge of this approach, one of the challenges of the approach, and one of the things I really haven't mentioned yet is, that inherent in this approach is that learning is really, really individual, right? You can't right. do the same thing for everybody. So there's no, there's no recipe or cookbook out there for how to do this because mm-hmm. it's going to be different every time you do it. So really the best way to learn how to, how to do this is just look at lots of different examples from lots of different coaches and kind of take what sounds resonates with you and sounds good to you. But so, yeah, but I think those, you know, Joan's book you mentioned and some of the other mm-hmm. ones are, are definitely a good, good resource to start. Yeah. So I actually, I own uh, the Dynamics of Skill Acquisition, okay. <laughs> the, uh, one of the older editions, very, very good book. Also very information dense. Um, it, uh, I, I rec- if, if you, if any of my listeners, listeners have an academic um, interest in, in this, I definitely recommend those books too, because like the cool thing about the dynamics of skill acquisition is that 
it really it walks you through in detail with all the different types of theories. Like, like he, I think it even goes through information processing theory and kind of gives you a, a, a an idea of how they relate to each other and and what they're all about. Yeah, definitely. And I, I was actually just I have an interview coming out next week with uh, Chris Button, the the lead author on on the that book and. The new edition is even nicer because it kind of mixes theory and practice all the way through. So you don't have nice. to get through the super theory heavy stuff for yeah. the four chapters before you get to the actual practical stuff. So, yeah, so, I'm yeah, not going to lie. I, yeah. I was a, my uh, it was very nonlinear journey through that book mm -hmm. for me because yeah. I wanted to look at the practical stuff first and then go back and look at the theoretical stuff. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so I think but, they, yeah, they take. Yeah, they've taken that yeah. feedback and, and changed it a little bit and reorganized That's great. it. That's yeah. great. Yeah. Do you do you have any other um, works that you recommend? Um, I think those are the good, the main ones to to start. And then I think mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of get. It sounds like there's getting a lot of resources out there uh, with podcasts. Um, there's a group that you may have heard of. I don't know if you've heard of uh, Emergence, which is a a group of of coaches that have uh, developed this kind of, it's like kind of educational thing for coaches interested mm -hmm. in applying ecological dynamics. Um, so I think, and there's these kind of, there's some online things that we're, we're actually doing, they're doing now with that, where they have a bunch of coaches just get together on a Skype call or something and talk about uh, different coaching ideas. And so I think I would, I would encourage uh, coaches to, to do that. Sometimes if it's not even in your sport, you can really get some good ideas. Um, yeah. Like I said, cause that really, Listening to to a coach, how they break down a practice session and, and the purpose and the constraints of revelation, I think is the, really the only way you can learn you learn this really well and apply it really well. You have to see it in action. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm so glad you brought that up. I've never heard of emergence, but that sounds way, way up my alley to get on a Skype call and just talk shop about coaching and practice design. Yeah, I um, know. No, definitely. They, um, so they're, they're a company you have to pay for their, their, I've done some things for them. They have to pay for them okay. normally, but yeah. this, with all the stuff going on right now, they've opened up their kind of weekly chats to anybody. Oh, so, cool. um, check them out on, on Twitter or something or their website and they'll, they'll, you can get on, on board. Yeah. Very cool. I'm, I'll put the word out on, um, I'm going to try and release this while we're still in quarantine, but, uh, if not, I'll, I'll, I'll definitely put the word out on social media and, and let people know. That's super cool. Thank you. Oh, you're, you're welcome. Awesome. So this is, uh, I want to be respectful of your time. And it's been like a super rich information dense episode. Um, <laughs> I think it's going to be awesome. So thank you very, very much for coming on the show. Oh, my pleasure, Josh. And uh, yeah, good luck with your everything, your podcast and everything. And uh, yeah, I'm always happy to talk about this stuff. Cool. Awesome. Um, I hope we can, uh, we can talk again sometime and, uh, uh, I'll see you around guys. Thank you so much for listening. If you have any feedback, you can email me at josh at combat learning.com or send me a message on facebook.com slash combat learning. Now, real quick, before I go, can I ask you a huge favor? If you got value from this episode, leave us a review on iTunes, Google podcasts, or whatever your favorite podcasting platform is. So many shows pop up and fizzle out. And we're talking about stuff that nobody else is talking about and we want to stick around. So leaving us a review helps us a ton. Finally, the show is produced by Micah Peacock. Thanks in advance and I'll see you on the next episode.